Welcome everyone to Pilgrim United Church of Christ and our Anti-Racism Book Club. Uh, this is our third session on James Baldwin. We're reading part two of Notes of a Native Son. I'm gonna make a few opening remarks after which our book club will go into their breakout rooms and we will end the live stream at that point. If you would like to join our book club, you can go to our Facebook events page and there you can find out about how you can get, uh, how you can join our uh, book club. So I will begin with a few introductory remarks on Notes of a Native Son, part two. One thing that stands out to me while reading Baldwin is his unflinching presumption to speak on behalf of all black people. The first time I noticed what he was saying, he wrote that he knew of no Negro, dot, 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 is the way he would phrase it. I know of no Negro, but it was key that he says he knew of no Negro. And I took that a modest modification. Him saying, there may be one or some, but I just don't know them. But as I continued to read Baldwin, I found that he was not at all making those modifications as he went on. He would repeatedly boldly claim to speak for all black people, all native sons and daughters born black in the United States of America. And what really caught my eye were these three passages that I'll share with you in a moment. And they each speak about the black child growing up in America and the challenge of raising a black child in the United States. It caused me to reflect on my own childhood and my own upbringing and on my parenting of two black daughters and two black sons. While he is certainly speaking of boys and girls, one gets the impression both Baldwin and Erica that it is the boys that he and we are most concerned with, concerned about. I've arranged the passages out of order to give a more logical connection in the point that I'm trying to make tonight. Starting with his notes on his father's funeral and his observation about all the parents in attendance at the funeral, all presumably black and speaking to presumably all black parents. Then, I read a, then I'll read a passage where he speaks of the inevitable condition of the black child by the time they reach their teen years. And finally, a passage that addresses the emotional and mental condition of every black adult native to America. So I'm gonna share my screen so you can read along with me. Notes of a Native Son, page 107. It was the Lord who knew of the impossibility of every parent in that room, that every parent in that room faced. How to prepare the child for the day when the child would be despised. That's my emphasis added the impossibility every parent in that room faced, how to prepare the child for the day when the child would be despised, and how to create in the child, by what means, a stronger antidote to this poison than one had found for oneself. The avenues, side streets, bars, billiard halls, hospitals, police stations, and even the playgrounds of Harlem, not to mention 
the houses of correction, the jails, and the morgue, testified to the potency of the poison, while remaining silent as to the efficacy of whatever antidote irresistibly raising the question of whether or not such an antidote existed. Raising, which was worse, the question of whether or not an antidote was desirable. Perhaps poison should be fought with poison. And then from the Harlem Ghetto, page 72. I can conceive of no Negro native to this country who has not, by the age of puberty, been irreparably scarred by the conditions of his life. All over Harlem, Negro boys and girls are growing into stunted maturity, trying desperately to find a place to stand. And the wonder is not that so many are ruined, but that so many survive. The Negro's outlets are desperately constricted. In his dilemma, he turns first upon himself and then upon whatever most represents to him his own emasculation. And finally, Notes of a Native Son, page 95. That year in New Jersey lives in my mind as though it were the year during which, having an unsuspected predilection for it, I first contracted some dread chronic disease, the unfailing symptom of which is a kind of blind fever, a pounding in the skull and fire in the bowels. Once this disease is contracted, one can never be really carefree again. For the fever, without an instant's warning, can recur at any moment. It can wreck more important things than race relations. There is not a Negro alive who does not have this rage in his blood. One has the choice, merely of living with it consciously or surrendering to it. As for me, this fever has recurred in me and does and will until the day I die. A lot of thoughts come to me from these passages. I look at my own life. I ask myself, was I irreparably scarred by the time I had reached puberty? And I thought about it. I looked at what happened in my life before I was 13 that scarred me. And there was certainly one incident that I'll never forget. I was five, maybe six years old when I witnessed a white gas station manager pull a gun on my mother and my three-year-old sister because they wanted to use the bathroom. In fact, my mother said to the station manager, she wasn't going to use the bathroom, it was just for her little girl. Now this would have been a perfectly normal event in Los Angeles, California, where we lived. But in 1961, we were visiting our grandparents in rural Tennessee. In the South, there was strict segregation, even of bathrooms. We've heard of the doctrine of separate but equal. But what is often failed to be mentioned is that when there were not separate facilities, there was no equality. And in this rural gas station, there was only one bathroom, and it was white. So the station manager pulled the gun and insisted to my mother, I told you before, she cannot use the white bathroom. You can take her out there behind that truck. And my father, emasculated, unable to help his wife 
and his three-year-old daughter. That was before I was 13. Then I asked myself the next question that Baldwin raises. What antidote did my parents give me to inoculate me against a world that would despise me? The one thing I remember, and I don't know if this was the strategy, if this the, what is what they considered their antidote, but my mother would always kind of pull me aside. Now, I had three other siblings and, and maybe she pulled them aside too, but she would pull me aside by myself and she would whisper in my ear, you're my pride and joy. Now, as a young man, that was embarrassing. It was like your mother kissing you and you're just like, well, stop, stop. But maybe what she was doing was building a self-confidence, a self-esteem in me that she knew I would need to face a world that would despise me because of my color. The other thing that my parents did, and this probably was a bit more deliberate, the first chance that we got, my parents moved us out of Watts and to West LA. And that also was when I was six years old. And so in West LA, I lived an integrated life. I got to know white people, they got to know me. I was inoculated against stereotypes because I knew them. I knew too many people that didn't fit what I was told and hopefully they knew me. And maybe that was my role in that community to inoculate them against stereotypes. And then I asked myself the question about how did I raise my children? How have I raised them to prepare them for a world that will despise them, waiting to poison them? Had I found a stronger antidote than the one my parents gave me? I certainly did raise them with a high, high value on education, with preparedness and hard work with the determination to go after what you wanted in life, no matter the obstacles, to keep at it and go after it until you achieved your goal in life. However, was that enough? My son, Madison III, was detained by the police for stealing his own bike. Now, he didn't steal his own bike, but he was just riding in the neighborhood and the police scooped him up, put him in the back of the cruiser, interrogated him about where he got his own bike. And after 45 minutes, they finally released him. Well, what does that do to a child? That you can't even ride your own bike without being accused of being a criminal. When I first read this uh, passage from Baldwin about the Harlem playgrounds as being part of the ways in which the world closes in on black children. I, I thought that was an odd one to be listed alongside the jails and the morgues. But then I remembered my son Marcus was caught in a gun crossfire at the local park, just three, three blocks from our home. Does that scar a child? He wasn't 10 years old. My son Madison III again was shot when he was in high school possibly in a racial attack. All four children of mine saw Rodney King beaten by the police. And in Los Angeles, we were well aware of Latasha Harlins, a 14, 15 year old young black girl who was shot dead because she threw an overpriced bottle of orange juice back at the store clerk. So I asked myself Baldwin's questions. Do my children, have this rage in their blood? Do they live with it? Or have they surrendered to it, been consumed by it? How often does this fever recur in them? In me, in every black person alive, in every native son and daughter. I'll end my remarks there and I'll end our live stream to Facebook.